Hi, everyone. My name is Mia Mussolino, and I'm with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Um, hold on a second. I want to start with a little bit of an overview on the Smithsonian for those of you who are not familiar with us. Um, I think a lot of people are, but you never know. Um, the Smithsonian is a vast complex of 19 museums, the National Zoo, and nine research centers. Um, we are based in Washington, D.C., but we have locations across the U.S. and in Panama. Um, our collection, this is where I have to read, <laughs> Our collections include an insect zoo, an ocean hall, an elephant house, a portrait gallery, NASA's Discovery Space Shuttle, Dorothy's Ruby Slippers, Abraham Lincoln's Top Hat, Parliament Funkadelic's Mothership, and just about everything in between. In all, the Smithsonian has collected and is preserving over 154 million artifacts. So the Smithsonian and Moodle make a really good match, I think, that we found out, um, and I hope to uh, show you some of that today. So first, a little Smithsonian history. I have worked at the Smithsonian for almost 14 years, and before I worked here, um, there, I uh, didn't even know much about the history of the Smithsonian, even though I lived in the Washington, D.C. area all my life, and was going to museums from a very young age there. Um, but the Smithsonian was formed in 1835 after wealthy British scientist James Smithson left his fortune to the United States of America to found at Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution <clears throat> an established for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And you would not believe how many times I hear that increase and diffusion of knowledge. It's all about us. Um, so back to Moodle. Oh, uh, the James Smithson had uh, a lot of scientific interests. Uh, coffee making, um, the, the uh, chemistry of human tears, and a lot of mineralogy. So he had a very um, eclectic kind of interest in things. And also, he had never visited the United States before he uh, gave his bequest. Um, okay, so back to Smithsonian and Moodle. We implemented Moodle in 2001, um, I'm sorry, 2012 under uh, Moodle version 2.1 um, as its internal learning management system. Um, <clears throat> we started with one course to train accountable property officers, pretty boring, um, <clears throat> sorry <laughs> to you accountable property officers out there. Um, and today our internal Moodle um, has about 265 courses um, and we train about 6,000 employees. We also use a customized version of the face-to-face -face plugin for about 17,000 annual classroom registrations. And um, I feel like this is a pretty big accomplishment because we've only been using it 2012, 2013, so we've done a lot. Um, then 2015 came, <laughs> so we had this internal Moodle. Um, it was going pretty good, and I started getting lots of people interested in training um, people who were affiliated with the Smithsonian or did work for us, like volunteers, but who didn't have Smithsonian network accounts. And I was turning them away, turning them away, turning them away. No, can't help you. Besides, I was too busy anyway. <laughs> But finally, we pretty much took the plunge because it, uh, we were about to open the National Museum of African American History and Culture in September 2016, and they had a burning need to um, train over 200 volunteers, who, and they had no building. Um, they had a small presence, they had some office space, but until they had their building, they really had nothing. But they really had a need to create a community of learners um, and uh, they really didn't have anything as far as learning material, um, artifacts for their volunteers to get used to and study, um, and their workers, really. Um, but over time, we um, implemented an external Moodle, which is outside the Smithsonian firewall, for them, and then other museums um, asked us if they could train their volunteers, so we've kind of grown. Um, we're now used, in addition to the internal Moodle, we have the external site, which is used by 10 Smithsonian museums slash units, uh, 25 educators, and we have 50 courses around. Um, there's about 6,800 learners. Okay, this, 
sorry. This is the, uh, what the external, we call it the Smithsonian external learning. So um, original, but anyway, this is what the uh, site looks like. Not many people who are learners see this because they go right to their category, their museum site, um, you know, category, or they go right to a course with a course key. Um, we make it pretty bland, pretty, pretty generic on purpose, kind of, because it's used by all the Smithsonian <coughs> museums. Um, we use email self-registration for volunteers who don't have a Smithsonian network account, and we use Active Directory authentication for um, employees and internal staff who build the courses. So next I'm going to show you how four Smithsonian organizations, units, museums, I don't really know what to call them, um, use uh, the external Moodle to train their volunteers. And um, I really had a good time finding pictures um, of all our people doing things, especially our educators. So that's one thing that I really wanted to bring into this. Um, is uh, all the educators that actually do the educating on the Moodle, um, the external Moodle. Um, so the National Museum of African American History and Culture opened in September 2016, and their educators came to me and they said, we really need this, um, and we don't have much time. <laughs> so um, we, like I said, we implemented the Moodle, uh, the external Moodle for them, and they, basically trained over 200 volunteers in subjects ranging from African American history and culture to visitor accessibility, um, safety topics, um, protection of minors, uh, uh, diversity training, pretty much just tons of different topics. Um, they had a vision of building a virtual community of learners and they needed to educate that community, as I said, um, rather quickly. So here's, here are two courses, um, just the front pages of their courses. Uh, I know you start to kind of see the detail, but um, they do all their own stuff. They pick out the activities uh, to use, and um, they use discussion forums a lot. Um, in fact, uh, just going along with the community of learners theme, before the museum even opened, um, we did a little count, and we found that there were over 4,000 forum posts in their course discussion forums um, before the museum even opened. Um, they use, like I said, discussion forums, quizzes, and SCORM lessons. Here is a SCORM lesson that incorporates a uh, live video of some educators <clears throat> outside the Smithsonian um, and curators who talk about the collection. Um, these were very, very important because they did not get to hold these things. They did not get to see them in person before the museum opened. So um, it was very important to have these SCORM lessons to learn from before the building opened. Another way they learned before the building opened was um, pictures uh, in the courses of um, interior of the building being built, um, exhibits being built, <clears throat> all kinds of things. Just things, <clears throat> sorry, that the uh, visitor services volunteers and staff would need to know, like, what's the cafeteria going to look like? Wh where are we going to meet people when they come in the door? I mean, you, there's a million things that they didn't even know. Um, so this was a very big resource for them. Here's an example of a quiz question that um, I actually helped them build um, or got them going with this idea of taking the mall, the map of the mall, the National Mall with all the museums, um, and kind of doing quiz question that um, made them match up <clears throat> where each building was. Uh, so that was important to them to have quiz questions that were engaging and allowed detailed knowledge. Oops. Okay, the next uh, organization is the Friends of the National Zoo. We also call them FONS, for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> um, FONS handles all of the visitor services, um, volunteer management, that kind of thing for the National Zoo. Um, and um, let's see, they started using Moodle in large part for safety training. Um, that was their immediate need, um, but then they quickly went into animal care training online, um, uh, like, like I said, facilitation, and of course, animal facts, 
that sort of thing, like what's in the exhibits, what does a mongoose do, or whatever. Um, so here are two examples, and I always like to say with the Fonz courses, I, I didn't pick the cutest pictures, I really didn't, because I feel really jealous of them that they get all these cute animals to put in their courses. So anyway, I picked a, what is that thing, iguana or something. But um, <laughs> here are two examples of Fonz courses. Um, they um, did have one course in 2016 that won an innovation, um, Smithsonian-wide Innovation in Education Award. It's not neither, either one of these, but um, it was, it was really, it was difficult to represent it on one page, so I did not include that. Um, here are some examples of um, quiz questions. They really like to use a lot of graphics. You can see on the left side, there's some bird feet that are being matched. Um, the learner has to match it to the species of bird. Um, at the top, very hard to tell, but it is a beaver lodge, and um, users would, learners would need to uh, answer the question by matching up the parts of the bird beaver lodge to, um, you know, what they're called. Now, this one on the bottom seems, uh, you know, run of the mill, except, <laughs> except it's about something called Code Green. And this was actually in their very first Moodle course, and their, co their course was called uh, Code Green, Code Green for volunteers. And um, I was, it took me a while, but I finally said, what the heck is Code Green? Code green means loose animal, so really important. <laughs> so, um, okay, the next museum, the National Museum of American History, um, they had the special challenge of having frequent exhibit changes, um, exhibits that changed a lot. They have very um, interactive exhibits um, for kids and adults, um, and they needed to get out facilit um, detailed facilitation instructions to their volunteers who managed a lot of the, didn't manage, but they facilitated and worked with the visitors a lot. They also uh, use a lot of forums for, um, announcements, volunteer announcements. In fact, they have a course called Volunteer Announcements, <laughs> where <laughs> basically that's how they communicate with their volunteers. Um, and here's a course. Um, they have two inquiry-based learning spaces. One is called the Object Project, and one is called the Spark Lab. And here's a course on the Introduction to Object Project, and it is um, consists mostly of lessons. Um, so if I could put a plug for lessons in. They use a lot of lessons. We use a lot of lessons. Um, and uh, they basically take people, here, the next page is a lesson, take people, take their volunteers as a walkthrough through the different um, areas of an exhibit. Um, they do their lessons with, um, a, they start with a PowerPoint, they save the PowerPoint as a series of like ping or JPEG files. Um, so that's how they build their lesson because it's very key to them to get it up and running quickly. As I said, their exhibits might change every few months, so they can't really spend a lot of time or um, on getting getting it up and running. Um, <clears throat> so that is, and they also use videos and they intersperse quiz questions in the lessons. The latest museum is the National Museum of Natural History. They almost didn't make it in here because they're so new to this, but they've been moving so fast that. <laughs> I said, why not? So, <laughs> so I put them in. Um, they, their, um, their needs really were, are a lot of scientific facts. Um, their education specialists are really, really specialists in very specific areas. Um, and so they, w they wanted to build lessons that were very detailed. Um, so, uh, they also use lesson and they use quizzes. They also use videos, photos, audio. And here are two lessons. They've done an introduction to the Sant Ocean Hall, which is their permanent ocean exhibit. Um, and then they have a temporary exhibit up on narwhals. So that is their narwhal course. And here is a narwhal lesson. And you can see that they put in a, um, an audio of what a narwhal sounds like underwater. Uh -oh. Oh, and when they make their lessons, they just use the HTML um, editor in the lesson uh, activity. So in preparing for this, 
uh, presentation, I took a look at the external Moodle and I just sat there with a pad of paper writing down all the topics that I could find. I didn't really get very far, I didn't get through all the courses, but while you're taking a look at this slide, I just wanted to tell you how my work starts with one of the educators in the museums. Um, I'll be sitting at my desk one day um, and they'll, somebody will just call me out of the blue or email me and say, hey, I heard about this external Moodle for, um, for uh, educating volunteers and I really need that. <laughs> And usually it's somebody I don't know because there's 6,000 people there, 6,000 employees. And I say, okay, you know, and I tell them a little bit about it. I enroll them in my online, um, I've built an online self-paced course for um, new Moodle users. So I enroll them in that to get them started. And they pretty much just take off on their own. They are amazing. Um, I just, part of the best thing about my job, I think, is just seeing what they come up with in their first course. So um, our educators are <coughs> sorry, <I don't coughs> our educators really are just the real stars of this whole story. Um, they are successful with Moodle with minimal training. Um, they develop creative, engaging, and effective content um, tailored to diverse audiences. And most of all, they are open to the risk of trying new things. Um, I can't stress this enough. And after yesterday's um, talk about innovation, that's what I should have said, um, that really I think that's a, a meaning of innovation um, in a lot of ways. And they are not afraid of pretty much anything. <laughs> um, so I thought I really want to take these people with me to the conference. And I wrote to all of them and I said, do you have anything you want to say about Moodle? Um, you know, I want to put it in my presentation. So a couple of them read that as not what I meant. <laughs> they, <laughs> they sent me audio clips. And I said, well, I didn't mean audio, but I'm thinking to myself, you know, they're so in the Moodle mode, you know, that's what they did. So I was like, but let's just do that. So I recorded four of their statements, um, four out of, I probably got six or seven responses, so I just didn't have time to use them all. Um, and so I'm going to play each one of them now, um, and they're just short. 30 seconds or so, and then I'll wrap it up. Moodle has been the core of our volunteer training program. It has allowed us to change the way that we structure all of our volunteer trainings and helped us embrace the idea of flipped classrooms, but for volunteer training. We've put all of our content on Moodle, including lectures, readings, videos, um, and everything else. Now we use our in-person time to focus on skill building and applying content. It has, as we think, made our trainings more engaging and useful for volunteers because we can spend more time tackling real life scenarios rather than spending time talking at them. As we were preparing to train over 200 volunteers, Moodle offered a number of solutions to help keep our students connected. One of my favorite features was the group discussion. It was a great way for the students to get to know each other and stay engaged in the weeks between in-person sessions. Moodle also provided our students with a good record of all the course announcements, the content covered in each session, and made it easy for students to catch up if they missed a session. Here at the National Museum of Natural History, we just used Moodle to pilot giving content training to over 70 new Narwhal and Ocean Hall volunteers. In not needing to cover this content in person, although we do review it just to check their knowledge, but it has saved us a lot of time so we could focus on other aspects of training that we could use in-person time for, such as facilitation. I train volunteers to run inquiry-based programs in a hands-on learning space. Often in training, I found myself cramming as much material as possible into each and every too short in-person training session. By rushing to cover everything I wanted them to learn, I became an example for what not to do. I wasn't modeling inquiry-based learning. Moodle allows us to move the introductory material online in a participatory way, freeing up our in-person sessions for practice and discussion both training components become richer as a result.
Okay, so right about now is where I tell you that um, when people find out I work at the Smithsonian, I always say something that goes something like this. I say, I don't do anything exciting. I just work a lot with a lot of people who do. So, and it's so true, because you can just tell these people just get out there every day and, um, you know, work with the public, and it's just amazing. They do amazing stuff. Um, so to wrap it up, um, I've been thinking about whether any uh, learning management system could match what we've accomplished with Moodle, um, and I really don't think that it could. Um, I think it's uniquely uh, capable, I don't know, um, <laughs> qualified to uh, do what we've done. We, the fact that we were able to take an internal LMS um, installation of Moodle and without really skipping a beat, without really even thinking about it, turn around and implement it um, for a whole different audience for just endless um, numbers of subject areas um, really speaks to um, how adaptable and uh, flexible Moodle is. Um, Moodle allows our educators creativity, promotes collaboration, and most valuable of, of all, it facilitates communities of learners, which is really what they needed in the volunteer arena. Um, one more thing. Okay, I can't get to my note here. Okay. Um, so thinking about James Smithson and what his goal was in even be, um, making his bequest for the increase and diffusion of knowledge, um, it really has struck me in, in putting together this presentation that that's really what Moodle is all about too. So thanks for listening. Does anyone have any questions? We do use badges. Um, I encourage people to use badges. It's usually, I, I mean, I'll just be honest, it's usually something that they think of at the end, um, but, and, and also they think about their audience. Um, some, some volunteer communities might think it's great and, you know, I don't know, I don't know whether it's like an age thing or I'm not really sure what, but um, I would say they're used maybe in 20 or 30 percent of the courses. Yeah. So, um, you're usually based on um, a whole course, but we do have a, um, a new user of the external Moodle. The Smithsonian Associates is giving badges actually for people who, uh, in Moodle, um, who attend X number of programs in a certain area. They might get the archeology span badge or the um, brain science badge or something like that. So they're, that's one way that they're using them. Okay, well thanks.